that was a pretty good intro. <laughs> I hope I can live up to it. So, uh, like Dr. Laughlin said, I am uh, Daniel Whitefield. Uh, the six years that I spent here were some of the best of my life. Uh, and I'm really excited to be back, and I'm excited so many of y'all came. Uh, more nervous, but uh, excited. So, uh, uh, like you said, I work in the lab of uh, Dr. Zach Edelman at a and in the entomology department. Um, I had zero experience with entomology before I started, so I've been learning a lot, and it's been a lot of fun. So, uh, yeah, I guess I'll uh, start explaining how we're engineering mosquitoes to suck less. So, uh, all right, so why, why do mosquitoes suck? Uh, well, it's not for food. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's not for food uh, because they uh, mostly feed on nectar. So males and females both feed on nectar. Um, it's so that they can make eggs. So this is one of the egg cups. It's about like the size of a shot glass, which none of y'all know what a shot glass is. It's a small glass about this big. Uh, and so, so we put some paper in there and then some water in the bottom so it gets the paper wet. So they'll lay on a wet surface just above the water line. Um, and so that means only females suck blood. Um, and it's because blood has a lot of protein in it. And so they use the extra protein from the blood to actually make the, to generate the eggs. Uh, all right, so how do mosquitoes suck? Uh, so they have fairly complex mouth parts. Uh, and so the first part is the labium, which is uh, this gray, the thicker gray part in the back. And so you can see that back here. Uh, it's flexible, it kind of bends back, and then the more uh, stiff uh, part of the proboscis actually goes into the skin. So that's the labium back here. And then uh, the labella are these pads or lips here that uh, make contact with the skin. And then they have uh, these A&M colored maxillae. Uh, and so these are, uh, they have little saw teeth right there. And so those are so sharp that you don't even feel them cutting. And so that's, that's what saws into the skin. And then their mandibles uh, hold the skin and other flesh and tissue apart so that uh, the other two parts can go in. And so that's the hypopharynx, which is uh, this bright green color. And so that has the salivary duct. And so that injects the saliva, uh, which has anti-clotting factors. It has... Uh, I think it's, it's got like a painkiller, so you don't really feel it until they fly away um, and different things. But it also sits on top of this trough that's the labrum, and so it seals the top of this uh, and makes that a tube, and so that's the actual blood feeding tube. So that's, that's, what, uh, so that's what stabs you. That's, that's what uh, they suck the blood out with. Uh, so that's, that's the business end. Um, so how bad do mosquitoes suck? Uh, spoiler alert, pretty bad. Uh, so malaria is uh, transmitted by mosquitoes, and it killed 627,000 people just in 2020. That was down a little bit because we've gotten better at uh, mitigation strategies and uh, decreasing uh, mosquito populations and increasing uh, protection against mosquitoes and their, and uh, malaria and different mosquito-borne diseases, um, but it's back up since then because COVID-19 has interfered with some of the mitigation strategies. And so uh, the numbers for 2021 and probably 2022 will be higher than that. Um, before some of the mitigation strategies got started, I think it was up, uh, it could have been as high as like 2 million a year. Um, and uh, some, of the, some of the symptoms of malaria are uh, splenomegaly and hepatomegaly. So the spleen and the liver will swell. And so you can see a child here um, with uh, sw a swollen spleen and swollen liver. Um, so it's a pretty horrible disease if untreated. Um, and it's actually, it's estimated that 5% of all the people that have died in history have died from malaria. Um, so Mosquitoes are probably, not even probably, I, I think I can be pretty sure, uh, mosquitoes are the most dangerous animal on the planet. Uh, they kill a lot of people every year. Um, the next disease is dengue or dengue virus. Uh, 40,000 people a year 
Uh, this is a pretty characteristic rash from dengue virus. Uh, some of the other viruses that I'm about to talk about have very similar rashes associated. Um, so yellow fever virus, uh, called yellow fever uh, because it affects the liver and so it can cause jaundice. And so uh, eyes turn yellow, skin turns yellow. Um, and so that, that's been a, a problem for a long time. Uh, Zika virus, you may remember from several years ago uh, when I was still here, actually. Um, and so in pregnant women uh, infected with Zika virus, that can cause uh, uh, microcephaly in babies. And so you can see that uh, this baby, uh, the cranium and the brain hasn't had, uh, the cranium hasn't fully developed, and so the brain hasn't had enough room to fully develop. Um, and then we also hear a lot about West Nile virus and chikungunya virus. Uh, and then something not in humans, but I think everybody uh, probably has a heart for. I didn't plan that to be uh, <laughs> a pun. Um, but uh, dyrofilariasis, um, which is heartworms in dogs. Um, and so something uh, that any, any pet owners uh, are really concerned with uh, that's also spread by mosquitoes. Um, so just some quick facts about mosquitoes. There's 3,600 different species, um, but they're, they're mostly selective feeders. And so uh, specific mosquito species will usually feed on specific uh, target species. And so only a handful of the 3,600 actually uh, are selective to humans. And so there, there's mosquitoes for, uh, it's, it's usually specific Species of mosquitoes will be targeted to snakes, frogs, birds, dogs, uh, all, all that different thing. So there's only a, a small fraction of the 3,600 that are targeted towards humans. And then only an even smaller fraction of that number actually spread disease in humans. And so those are mosquitoes from the genera Aedes, Anopheles, and Culex. And so Aedes spreads most of the viruses. So uh, uh, dengue, yellow fever, all of the viruses are spread by Aedes. Anopheles <laughs> spreads the four different subtypes of malaria. And then Culex spreads filaria, which is a roundworm disease, and then certain bacterial infections also. Um, and so this is Aedes aegypti, which is the particular species of mosquito that we study most commonly in the lab. We have, I think we have some Anopheles and maybe some Culex, but we don't do a whole lot with those. 80s are just much easier to work with in the lab. And so we, we generally study 80s and uh, we'll generalize that to the other species. Um, and so I try, this isn't necessarily to scale, but I tried to eyeball it to where the relative size between the female up here and the male is about what the relative size difference is. Um, because the, the females are larger, but other than the size, you can tell uh, females and males apart from their antenna. So the females, they have some hair coming off of the antenna, but it's fairly sparse. And so when you, when you look at the female antenna, they usually just look like uh, just one kind of prong coming out. Um, but the males, the hair is much more pronounced. Um, and so they kind of look like feathers. Um, and then these organs here, just above the proboscis, are much smaller in females. And then here you can see that they come out and uh, sort of makes their proboscis look like a trident. Uh, so you can tell that fairly easily. And then uh, the size of the abdomen, obviously females have to fit eggs and blood meals. And so they're much larger and the males are uh, much more anemic. Um, and then something that's unique to 80s, a species of mosquito is they kick their back legs up when they land like this and so they use those as extra sensory organs and so they can they can sense air movement and uh, some other stuff and so uh, it's sort of like they turn their back legs into an extra pair of uh, antennae um, and they also don't need those um, the, their back legs aren't that necessary so when we do genotyping we just rip their back legs off yeah. Uh, so this is the global range of Aedes aegypti. Um, and so you can, pretty, you can see that they're pretty much everywhere that is wet enough and uh, warm enough 
for mosquitoes. Uh, so, you know, not many in the Sahara where there's no water, uh, not many uh, in Siberia where it's too cold, but pretty much everywhere else uh, you're going to get Aedes aegypti. Uh, all right, so the life cycle of Aedes aegypti, so it starts with a blood meal, um, and mosquitoes will lay 40 to 50 eggs per blood meal. So think about all the times that you've been bitten by a mosquito and multiply that by 40 to 50, and that's how many mosquitoes are made of your blood. Uh, and so, so 80s in particular will lay their eggs just above the water line in whatever container they can find. And so when it rains, the water level rises, and when the eggs get wet, then they'll start hatching out uh, pretty soon after that. And so that's why you see a huge population explosion of mosquitoes after it rains. And then there's four different larval stages. So they'll do a molt and get bigger each time. And then uh, they'll turn into pupa. Oh, I have pictures too. So this is a line of embryos that I lined up myself. Uh, I've gotten better at it, so they're straighter now. But uh, this one's a little crooked. Uh, and then just, just so you can see how big these are, that's my finger for scale. Uh, so we do that under the microscope. Um, and then these are uh, larvae. These are L4s. So these are about a centimeter, maybe a little bit longer than a centimeter. Um, and so we put those on Petri dishes and look at them under the microscope. Uh, and then uh, pupa. So uh, I think it's in my other talk tomorrow. So if you want to know why their eyes are different color, come tomorrow. Uh, but it's, it's pretty cool. All right, so how do we make them suck less? That's what we're all here for. Uh, so, uh, so there's different prevention initiatives. And so these are, these are ways to uh, control or to sort of organize uh, the different control strategies. And one of them is just public sanitation infrastructure. So a lot of the places that are the most uh, affected by mosquito-borne diseases um, have poor public sanitation. So this is an open sewer. Um, and so just designing uh, just health sanita sanitation infrastructure, having closed sewers, having uh, just, just clean water supply, et cetera, um, helps with mosquito-borne diseases. Um, and then public health education, so just uh, educating people on how uh, mosquitoes reproduce, what their life cycle is, um, how they spread disease, et cetera, uh, that, that can really help. Uh, and then uh, community engagement is usually organizing uh, communities to go uh, check for stagnant water reservoirs and just dump uh, spare tires. I tried to get the nastiest one that I could find. Uh, and then... Uh, but not just spare tires, obviously, like tarps that can hold water or, you know, buckets or, or any, any sort of thing that can uh, hold water. Just getting the community involved to check around their house, check around their neighborhood, and just uh, remove those places where mosquitoes can uh, spawn. And then surveillance and monitoring is usually more uh, like scientists doing genetic testing to see what species of mosquitoes are entering certain areas, uh, keeping an eye on uh, mosquito-borne disease prevalence, and uh, just uh, that, so that's what surveillance is, is uh, looking at the types of mosquitoes, looking at the types of diseases, and keeping track of how those uh, numbers are changing. And so all of these uh, are just ways to organize people uh, so that uh, we can go through the uh, control strategies for mosquitoes. So there's four different main uh, categories of control strategies. So the first is mechanical control. And so that's things that mechanically keep mosquitoes away or keep them from reproducing. So mosquito nets uh, to protect people while they sleep, um, removing stagnant water, uh, building design. So this one, uh, other than just getting a picture of a door or a window, um, I didn't have a great picture for it, but it's, it's basically just having doors that seal well when they're closed so that mosquitoes can't fly in in a gap underneath them, uh, windows that seal. Uh, also, in a lot of places where uh, mosquito-borne diseases are really rampant, they'll just have uh, corrugated steel roofs, and a lot of times there's gaps in between the top of the wall 
and where the corrugated steel roof is. So just uh, sealing those uh, holes. So it's, it's mainly just designing buildings and making sure that they're difficult for mosquitoes to get in to bite people while they're asleep or while they're you know, sitting and listening to some crazy guy give a lecture. Uh, and so then there's chemical control. So obviously that's insecticides and those can come in a couple different forms. So you can put it in the water and it'll kill larvae as they're spawning. Um, and then adulticides is pretty self-explanatory. Uh, but the scale, uh, there's, there's several different scales that that can happen at. So that can just be at the scale of a household. So you can go to the store, buy insecticide. Um, it could be industrial scale where it's a guy in like a hazmat suit with a, a fogger uh, just spraying uh, huge areas with uh, insecticide. Uh, it could be at the governmental level uh, with literally just trucks with foggers spraying insecticide through a whole neighborhood. Uh, I wouldn't recommend DDT. Um, this is an old picture. Uh, with, it's not used very much anymore. Uh, but uh, And then the next two, uh, so there, there's different categories within, or there's, there's different end goals, I guess, for the next two uh, control mechanisms. Um, one is population suppression. And so that's to reduce the population. So that, that's generally stuff that kills the mosquitoes, uh, keeps them from reproducing. Uh, and so those are usually things that are lethal to the offspring. And then there's population replacement. And so that changes the population, usually with the goal of making them less pathogenic. All right, so the third, the third control mechanism is biological control. And so, uh, so you can just add a fish in the genus Gambusia because they feed on larvae. So that would be population suppression because they're eating the larvae, keeping them from becoming adults. Then there's Wolbachia bacteria, which is an intercellular parasite. So it's, it's bacteria that gets uh, not just in bodies, but inside the individual cells. And so this can actually be population suppression or population replacement. And so if you uh, infect just males with Wolbachia, and then release only uh, male infected Wolbachia, or male mosquitoes infected with Wolbachia, then when they mate with females, there is a uh, cytoplasm mismatch between the sperm and the egg. And so when the mosquitoes lay eggs, they just don't hatch. And so that's essentially making the males infertile. Um, and then you can also do population replacement. And so you can deliver uh, genes with the Wolbachia, and so the Wolbachia will produce whatever uh, protein or, or compound you want in the mosquitoes, and then that can, you can target that to, have, to make them less pathogenic, so uh, it could uh, kill the pathogens, it could kill the mosquito if they get infected with the pathogens, there's uh, various different strategies, but so that one you can release uh, females or well, females are more useful, so you can release females, and so when they mate with wild males, then they infect everybody. And so then it just changes the population to a population that's resistant to whatever pathogen you're targeting. Uh, and then there's Bacillus thuringiensis israelensis bacteria, uh, which acts as a biological uh, pesticide. And so this would be a population suppression mechanism. And so what that is, is it's, uh, it's a bacteria that infects the protists and other things that the mosquito larvae eat. So that all the dots inside this um, are uh, this bacteria. And so then these things are that. And so the uh, larvae eat their natural food, but their, their food has been contaminated with this bacteria. And then what this does is it will cause perforations in their uh, digestive system and kill the larva. And so it's basically just, it's a biological pesticide. Um, and then there's genetic control. And so uh, you hear a lot about, uh, this is something that's actually being employed. Um, so sterile male release. And so they usually just breed huge amounts of mosquitoes in a lab and then irradiate the males to sterilize them and then release them. And so when they mate with females, uh, then the eggs that the females lay are just infertile. And so they don't hatch. Um, and then uh, there's also a genetic modification. So we're getting uh, closer into what I actually do in the lab. And so the, 
And similar to Wolbachia, this can be either population suppression or replacement. Um, the problem with normal genetic modification is you release genetic, or one of the problems, is you release genetically modified mosquitoes. And then just because of normal inheritance, that uh, genetically modified uh, gene is diluted once they start mating with wild mosquitoes. And so our next strategy uh, to prevent that is gene drive. And so that, that causes the modified gene to push through the population at a higher rate than it would naturally. Um, so <laughs> if that sounds scary, you're not alone, because what, what if it goes wrong? Uh, so uh, what our lab specifically focuses on is making gene drive, quote unquote, biodegradable. And so what that means is that the modified gene deletes itself over time. And so uh, what you can do is field test it, uh, because laboratory testing can only get you so far. It's small populations, and so you can't, it's, it's much more difficult to see exactly how it's gonna propagate through the population. And so you need to do field testing, but if you're testing it, it may not be ready. <laughs> and so you want, it, you want the field testing to be temporary, so if something's not quite where you want it to be, if there's off-target effects or uh, you know, something bad happens, you want that to be temporary. And if it's out in the wild, you can't just go around with a, a butterfly net and catch them all. And so, uh, so making it biodegradable is a way of making uh, the gene drive delete itself and be temporary over time. So that, uh, and this is uh, completely without our interference, we just design it to do this automatically. Uh, and so it makes uh, the genetic modifications uh, delete themselves so that they, they don't stick around forever. Um, so let's talk about the science. Um, so, uh, so I know a lot of you probably uh, have taken Dr. Laughlin's class, taken other people's class, but uh, I'm going to start basic and then get actually fairly technical with this talk. So. We're going to start slow and uh, build from there. So, uh, so what is DNA? It's uh, a molecule that stores the information needed to make proteins. And so, uh, so we learn, I mean, most people just intuitively know that they need protein in their diet. But that's sort of any protein uh, works at, for you know, dietary reasons for nutrition. Uh, but if you zoom in to specific proteins, each different type of protein performs a specific task. So there's uh, a bunch of different proteins doing a bunch of different things. And what I have focused on with my research is uh, the proteins that do DNA repair because a third of your entire proteome is dedicated to protecting the information that uh, is used to make your entire proteome. And so a third of all the genes that you have uh, code for DNA repair proteins. Um, all right, so getting into DNA damage. Uh, so there's many different causes. Some of them you can prevent. Some of them you're just stuck with. Uh, so the natural ones that you're just stuck with are from when DNA is copied. You can just have replication errors, and so you can't avoid that. That's just going to happen. Uh, but that's why a third of your genome is for repairing. Um, there's also just natural metabolism, generates uh, some harmful uh, different uh, chemical species, mostly different types of reactive oxygen that will just oxidize whatever they come into contact with. Uh, can't get away from that either because you can either uh, deal with this or not eat and die. So, uh, And then there's radiation, which is one of the uh, more avoidable um, certain types of radiation, like just sunlight uh, is hard to stay away from, but uh, not drinking from the water fountain at Chernobyl, you can avoid that. Um, and then there's chemicals. So uh, these are more avoidable, so don't smoke. Um, and, then, and, you know, there's various different uh, carcinogens that you can avoid. There seems to be more in California, but that's another story. Um, also chemotherapeutics. So the way that most chemotherapy works, and this is more related to what I did in grad school, but 
Uh, the way that most chemotherapy works is it damages DNA, hopefully more often or more severely in cancer cells than in normal cells. But most chemotherapeutics are targeted at either uh, reducing your uh, cancer cell's ability to repair DNA or they directly cause DNA damage. Um, so there's different types and they fall into a few main categories. So there's breaks. So you have single strand breaks that just break uh, through one of the backbones. So DNA is double stranded. So it just breaks through one of the backbones. Double stranded DNA, as you might have guessed, breaks through both strands. And so you have a full disconnect. And so these are just you know, free independent moving if you have a, a double strand break. So that's the most uh, uh, damaging, no, it's the most uh, deleterious I don't want, uh, kind of DNA damage. Uh, and then some of the other ones are cross links. And so you can permanently bind the two strands together, which you want them to be able to unzip. So you don't want them permanently bound together. And then there's also, you can bind uh, base pairs uh, within the strand. And so that just, that keeps uh, proteins that need to move uh, down the DNA strand from moving down the DNA strand or bind, binding to. Um, and then there's modification. So that's things like from oxidation, from reactive oxygen. Uh, there's other things that it's just like chemical boondoggles that just get added to the DNA that's useless and it, it prevents uh, the proteins that read the DNA from being able to do their job. Uh, and so what I focus on, what I focused on in grad school, what I'm focusing on now is uh, double strand breaks. And then there's several different ways that double strand breaks can be repaired. And so uh, get into some of the more technical stuff. So there's multiple pathways. And, and so you want, you want multiple safety nets to make sure that the damage gets repaired. And so having multiple pathways gives the cells multiple tools to use to be able to repair the damage. Um, and so some of these, particularly the double strand break repair pathways, uh, can be uh, used by scientists that do genetic engineering. And so uh, some of the pathways uh, we'll focus on uh, because they directly have to do with the research that I've been doing. So one's called single strand annealing, or SSA, and then the other is called homologous recombination, which is HR. So single strand annealing, so you have this double stranded DNA, and then these, these purple boxes are just uh, sequences in the DNA that are the same as each other. So, so this is the exact same sequence as this. And so the way the single strand annealing works is if some damage happens in between these two repeats and causes a double strand break, then uh, there's proteins that'll bind and then chew up one half of each of these strands. And so you get the single strand, so the single strand annealing. So it chews it up, gets the single strand. And then these repeats, since they're complementary, they'll stick together. And so the, the repeats will stick together and then you'll have these single strand pieces just kind of sticking up uh, out and just in the nucleoplasm. And then they will be clipped off by specific proteins. And so then you'll have that, and then that's a fairly easy thing for uh, other proteins to come in and stitch back together. So you've gotten rid of the double strand break so that the DNA is repaired, but as you can see, there's a fairly significant deletion, so you're losing information. And then the second one is homologous recombination. So this is the most difficult for the cell to actually do because uh, very specific conditions have to be met. So you have to have uh, two copies of DNA. So this will only happen during specific uh, times within the cell cycle because you need uh, two copies because it uses one as the template to repair the other. So if you have some damage event, causes a double strand break, then proteins will come in, bring, bring the extra copy into close contact, and it, there, there'll be enzymes that, there'll be proteins that read uh, the template copy and just copy that over to fix whatever got deleted or damaged here. And so then once it's repaired, then you have fully intact, there's no deletions, there's no insertions, there's no mutations. Uh, so it's the most accurate, but it's also the most difficult to do. Uh, and then, uh, so this is not DNA repair, this is, uh, one of the more recent 
uh, genetic engineering tools. Um, and so this technology has only been around for about a decade, and it's only been uh, super popular since uh, I was started grad school. So, uh, so CRISPR-Cas9, you can think of it as uh, a set of uh, scissors with a mat. And so the scissors are a Cas9 protein, which cuts DNA. And then the mat is sgRNA. Uh, and the SG is a single guide. So single-stranded guide RNA, because it guide because it's a map. And then RNA is a very similar molecule to DNA. And so uh, it has a sequence on the single guide RNA that will bind to a very specific sequence in the DNA. And so you can, you can tailor this to target a very specific place within the DNA. So if you want to uh, cut something or insert something at a particular place in the genome, then you just give the Cas9 the right map, and then it'll go and it'll bind to that particular sequence and cut uh, the, the DNA. And so if you just have these two things together, then you'll just generate a double strand break at that, uh, just after that sequence. But if you get it some sort of cargo gene, if you're trying to do genetic engineering, then when it cuts, it'll insert that cargo gene and some of the cell's natural DNA repair mechanisms will make sure that that gets uh, fully incorporated and is just part of the genome now. All right, so getting into gene drive. So normal inheritance, so if we just made genetically modified mosquitoes and released them and didn't uh, have any sort of gene drive mechanism. So normal inheritance, you have this genetically modified male, and we usually use males just because they're, it's much easier for them to spread their genetic material. Uh, they can mate with three to five females uh, before they need a, a break, and then it's usually three, four days later they can mate with three, or three to five more females. Um, and so you make sure that uh, their uh, genome from their dad, or their, their uh, set of genes from their dad and their set of genes from their mom is both this, ha both has this genetic modification that you've given them. And so when they mate with wild females that have just the normal wild type uh, set from their dad and the normal wild type set from their mom. Then they'll make a hybrid. Uh, it'll be male and female, but I just use male uh, because it's easier for the, for the figure. So, uh, so you'll have hybrid mosquitoes. Um, and so obviously the, uh, from their dad, it'll be genetically modified. And then from their mom, it'll be wild type. And so then th they'll mate with more wild type mosquitoes and so you'll only have 50% of those will be hybrid, and then 50% of the grandchildren will be wild type. And so you can see uh, the next generation, it'll only be 25%, and then 12.5%, et cetera. And so you can see that this is washing itself out of the population. It's not really pushing through the population. Uh, with gene drive, you start with the same thing. So when it mates with a wild female, then you get the same hybrid, but with the gene drive, what it does is it'll copy the genetically modified copy of the gene from the dad over the mom's copy that's wild type. And so you'll go from just a single copy out of the two to a double copy from both, uh, essentially from both parents. And so then when it uh, mates, instead of 50% hybrid, 50% wild type, they're all hybrid. And then the same thing will happen, so you have both copies again, and so that just keeps pushing through the population. Um, and so that, that's just gene drive uh, in, in general, and so uh, what we want to do is make that biodegradable. And so uh, the way that gene drive actually happens, uh, or well, one strategy, I should say, um, is with our old friend homologous recombination, and so this is the one that it's the <laughs> it, it's the most uh, it's the most difficult, but it's also the most accurate. And so uh, so we add something to the modified gene that will target the wild type gene that we want to replace. And so we'll add something that will make a di uh, double strand break in the wild type gene. And so you have this double strand break here. And homologous recombination is the one that only happens if you have two copies. 
So it goes and it reads the other copy and it uses that as a template to repair this damage. And since it's using our modified gene as the template for repair, then it just copies it over. And so the wild type becomes the modified gene. And so that's, that's how we do, uh, that's our strategy. Uh, there's a few other strategies, but th that's our strategy for gene drive. And then uh, the way that we make it biodegradable is our old friend SSA. And so when we build our modified gene, we'll also make sure that uh, part of what we're inserting is repeat sequences as bookends to the modification that we've made. And so since there's these repeat sequences, then SSA can happen. And so we'll also put in something that attacks itself. And so it'll cause a, a double strand break on itself. And so when this is repaired, then SSA will happen. And so it chews it up, makes it single strand, brings the repeats together. And so everything that we've added in that's modified is on, is, since it's in between these repeats, it's in these overhangs that get clipped off. And so we've gotten rid of all of the, the genetically modified stuff. And then when it's repaired, then the genetic modification is just deleted. And so just uh, sort of zooming out, just looking at a population of wild type mosquitoes. Uh, okay, so we, we add in a small population of genetically modified males, and then they spread through the population. And then uh, sort of at random, the uh, deletions will start happening and it'll send them back to wild type. And so they go back to essentially wild type. And so it's temporary, so. Uh, all right, so um, I guess wrapping up, I just wanted to talk about some of the public, the published research from the lab. Uh, and so uh, I just have just some screenshots of the titles and some of the authors. Um, and so these two papers are about the gene drive safety um, because uh, when you start messing with genes and making uh, genetically modified stuff, and then you start talking about releasing it into the wild, uh, that that's a serious thing. And I know I've, tr I've tried to add in some jokes and make, make the, the uh, conversation a little more light, uh, but that's just to hold attention and make it enjoyable. Uh, we do take safety and uh, just making sure that uh, we're not you know, irreversibly damaging the environment seriously. And so there's a few papers, and I'm sure you can find more about uh, safety precautions. And uh, some, of the, some of the safety precautions are uh, not even necessarily uh, like scientific strategies. It's working with local governments, it's working with uh, local charities, just community leaders, and just, just talking to them and trying to be, uh, explain exactly what we're doing, uh, be open and transparent about what we're doing, and uh, you know, different uh, precautions that we're taking. So uh, if you want to read more about that, there's these two papers, um, and uh, I'm sure mo many more out there. Uh, but these two are uh, from our lab. So. Uh, and then if you want to learn more about the specific uh, mechanism of making the gene drive biodegradable, uh, this is an excellent paper. Um, and so that was, that was out of our lab also. And then, uh, and then I mentioned that we could do some genetic modifications, but I didn't really talk about exactly what we're changing. And so if you want to read more about those, uh, here's a three papers. Um, this one, uh, some people in our lab discovered uh, the protein that if it's expressed, the mosquitoes are male, and if it's not expressed, then they're female. And so, uh, and then a later paper, this NIX is uh, sort of, uh, transcriptional control over that protein. And so if you make sure that NIX is expressed, then the male determining factor is also expressed. And so these two are basically, if we push that through a population with our gene drive, then all of their offspring will be male. And so male mosquitoes spread the gene, but they also don't bite people, so they don't spread disease, and they also don't lay eggs. 
And so uh, that's, that's one of the things. Another thing is uh, the proteins that make up the flight muscles of mosquitoes are different based on uh, male and female. And so we can selectively knock out the female flight muscles so that the females are flightless. And so a mosquito that can't fly is a mosquito that can't drink very much blood and spread very much disease. Um, but the males are still, can still fly, and so they can push the gene through the population. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, so just want to acknowledge everybody that's working on this research in our lab. So uh, our principal investigator, uh, boss, as we call him, uh, is Zachary Edelman. And then there's several postdocs in our lab. I mostly work with Kuhn. Uh, but everybody else has uh, helped me a lot, uh, learning the ropes, uh, teaching me about mosquitoes, and learning all the all the new stuff that I didn't know before. And then we have uh, some uh, PhD students. Our master's student is actually working double duty because he's also one of our paid research assistants. Uh, our new lab manager, um, other research assistants, our undergraduate, and then also uh, people that pay pay. Uh, pay the bills and uh, buy my dog dog food for me, uh, the National Institute of Health. So, uh, all right, so thank you. So we, we've got a couple of minutes here that we're gonna open up the floor to have some questions if you have some of those. Um, I want you to hear me say something that I hope is valuable to you. Everything is cumulative. You heard science. You heard English. You heard communication. You heard from his biblical perspective and an introduction. You don't know that he is musically inclined. Everything is cumulative. There is not a class that you will not take that is not meaningful and you just saw it unfold in about 45 minutes. Please, if you have any questions, let's field those at this time. Yes. Okay, I'm not a science student, but what would be bad about completely eradicating all mosquitoes? <laughs> <laughs> um. Okay, so the, the question is, what would be bad about completely eradicating all mosquitoes? Uh, so the, the joke among entomologists is the only thing that good, or the only thing that mosquitoes are good for is making more mosquitoes and spreading disease. Um, but nature is complex, and so uh, the obvious things that mosquitoes do uh, are the bad things that we know about but uh, if, if we just completely eradicated, there may be a lot of off-target things that could happen. Um, so, I mean, mosquitoes play a role in the food web. They're, they're food for other species. Um, some people might argue that other things can be food for, for other species. Bats, bats eat more than just mosquitoes. Fish eat more than just mosquito larvae. But uh, we... It's one of the situations where we don't know what we don't know, and what we don't know may collapse an ecosystem. And so we don't necessarily want to just eradicate them, even though everybody just wants to eradicate them. <laughs> yes? This doesn't really have anything to do with what you said, but are they pollinators? Yes, that, yeah, they are. Uh, so since they, since, so the, the question is, are, are mosquitoes pollinators? Um, so since they mostly drink nectar, uh, they are pollinators. Uh, so. Yes? Is it true that mosquitoes are more attracted to a certain blood type versus all types of blood? So I don't know the specific science, um, but I... I know enough to say I think so. <laughs> um, I think it's, so there, there's definitely some people that mosquitoes are more attracted to than other people. Some people get eaten alive and some people hardly ever get mosquito bites. I think 
it's probably more complicated than just blood type. Um, but uh, yeah, there's, there's definitely some people that are much more attractive to mosquitoes than others. So, yes. How many mosquito bites do you get? And it's really part of a question. Tell us kind of what you do on a daily basis. Do you end up with actual mosquitoes around you and give oh. us some tasks? <laughs> yeah. So how many mosquito bites do I get? Like in the lab or just in general? In the lab. In the lab? Uh, not that many, but it happens. Uh, so one of my first days actually being in the lab after I'd gotten finished with onboarding, a mosquito landed on my arm. And since it's in the lab and it's data, uh, I wasn't sure if I should kill it. And so I just kind of watched it suck some of my blood. And then like when I realized it was sucking my blood, it was just reflex. And so the curiosity left and I just swatted it. And then I was like, actually, I don't know. What's the proper procedure? Do, do we just kill them? And they're like, yeah, if they're out of their enclosure, just kill them. The, no, no questions, just so. Uh, it's happened a few times. Uh, the, we, we don't let them just, you know, fly around the lab. We have uh, homemade stuff. It's actually uh, popcorn cups. We'll just hot glue them together, um, cut some holes in the side, put some mesh and some different things to kind of make our own enclosures. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty uh, uh, homemade. Uh, the, I mean, we have incubators that keep them at the right uh, humidity and temperature that are what you'd expect in a science lab, but the, the individual enclosures that we keep the mosquitoes, uh, it, it, it looks like a concession stand. Um, <laughs> but, so we, we try to keep them from flying around the lab, but some get out because you're dealing with hundreds, thousands of mosquitoes, and so it's going to happen. Uh, but we have like the electrified tennis rackets all around the lab, and those are quite fun to use. <laughs> Oh, and then you asked about day-to-day. -day. Um, so, uh, so we rear the mosquitoes ourselves. And so you saw the egg cup, and so there's paper in there. So uh, we'll take those out and let them dry. And so, so this is something I sort of hinted at, but didn't fully explain. So the reason that we use Aedes aegypti instead of some other species is they're perfectly fine if their eggs get dried out. And so we'll dry out the egg papers and then seal them in like a plastic sleeve. And so those are good for like three months. You could probably stretch it further, but we try to uh, get a, we try to hatch them out at least after three months. Um, other species of mosquitoes like Anopheles or Culex, um, you have to just constantly just keep those going. And so it's, it's just, it's a lot of work and it's annoying especially if it's a line that you're not actually doing experiments on. And so Aedes is just much easier to work with in the lab because you can store the egg papers. Um, okay, so we, we'll dry the egg papers, we'll store them, uh, we'll hatch them out. So we just have like pans of water that's about an inch deep and we just drop the egg paper in there. A few hours later, you'll see L1s swimming around. Um, and then uh, usually about five-ish days later, they'll start pupating. And so uh, it, we got the mosquito life cycle down like clockwork. And so we usually hatch on Wednesdays because then they start pupating on Monday. And then they'll pupate all week and we can pick the pupa. And then they'll pretty much be done by Friday so we don't have to come in on the weekends. Sometimes their life cycle is altered. And so we gotta come in on the weekends. Uh, which is annoying, but usually it's my fault anyway uh, because I just hatched them at the wrong time or I let them get too dense. Because if they're, if they're in the pans and there's way too many in a pan, they'll grow slower. Um, so, uh, yeah, pick pupa, uh, sort them by sex. So the pupa are also different sizes. So we have a, 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 a machine, not like a mechanical machine, not like a powered machine. Uh, a simple machine, Scott. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, it'll, it'll sort them by size. And then uh, I have not gotten very good with that. So I usually have 
females in with my males and males in with my females. Um, females in with the males is not so bad because you just don't use those. But if a male gets in with a female pop, then uh, you, they're contaminated and so you just got to throw the whole thing. Um, so I usually sort them by hand. So you can tell, uh, larvae you can't tell the sex, but starting with the pupa and then uh, certainly the adults, you can uh, look at the last segment on their tail and tell, tell the difference between uh, males and females. And so I, especially for ones for experiments, I will sort those with a paintbrush and a microscope. Um, and it takes a long time, but it's more accurate. So, uh, so yeah, just in general, taking care of mosquitoes. Um, so some of the experiments that we run, we'll do injections. So the way that we actually get the genetically modified stuff into the mosquitoes is uh, we'll have uh, these micro needles that we make in house um, and inject embryos. And so if you come tomorrow to my presentation, you'll see more about how that works. Um, and then we'll do just some normal uh, just lab stuff like the genotyping. I mentioned we rip off their back legs. We'll put that in a solution that will uh, release their genomic DNA into the solution. Then we can pipe that, pipette that into a 96 well plate and uh, do uh, genotyping. Um, yeah. We feed them sucrose. So we just have a sack of sugar and a one liter bottle and just make a 10% sucrose solution. And just, we have little cotton balls that we put on top of uh, the mesh that's on the top of the enclosure and soak that in sucrose. And that's how we feed them, so. Our time here has come to a close, but before we uh, say thank you to Dr. Whitefield, I wanna remind you, some of you, are uh, going to go eat lunch with us, and so we're going to head that way here shortly. Um, you have the opportunity to ask many more questions. There is another presentation that he will give that will be more technical, so uh, I'd encourage you to consider that. I'd also consider, uh, hope that you will consider going to uh, the other speakers. There's uh, uh, another one tonight at 7 o'clock. I think it would be great if you could participate in that. Thank you for your participation. Help me give Dr. Whitefield another round of applause.